Hello, I'm Harrison McLeod, Rector at Christ Church in Greenville, South Carolina. I'd like to welcome you to this offering of the Rector's Forum. Uh, before we um, resume our study of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, let me offer a, a prayer for us to begin our time. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son Jesus Christ came down from heaven to be the true light which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread that He may live in us and we in Him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As I mentioned, uh, we are continuing to look at, uh, at, at the Gospel of Matthew, and, and today uh, we'll pick up uh, where we left off. We've, we've gone through uh, chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7, which are uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and then uh, we, we turn to chapter 8. Um, and so before we turn to chapter 8, I, I'd like to sort of uh, provide just a little bit of context. Uh, when I think about um, our worship services together here, we always offer a confession in the Episcopal Church. Um, and we, we pray for um, things we have um, done in thought, word, and deed. Uh, pray for forgiveness. Um, and, and that's so important because uh, what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount uh, at the beginning of chapter 5 is that if we've thought about something, then in fact perhaps we've, uh, we've committed that sin. Uh, we don't actually have to, to act that out or, or to say what's on our mind, but, but if we have the thought, then perhaps we're, we're guilty. And so um, uh, we, we, we experience remorse for those things that we have done in either thought, word, or deed. Um, uh, things done or left undone. So we recognize we've, we've all done things we perhaps should not have done and we've not done things that we ought to have done. Um, and then principally, we, uh, we've not loved God with our whole heart and mind and we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Um, so if, if we look at those components of our confession on Sundays, then uh, we, we really touch on aspects of the Old Testament and the New Testament um, specifically, um, uh, the, the, the command to love God with your whole heart and mind um, out of Deuteronomy and then out of Leviticus uh, to love our neighbor as ourself. Um, so so we, really, we, we really concentrate and think about word and deed. Uh, in fact, our worship service on Sunday in the Episcopal tradition uh, is divided up into two parts. We, we call the whole service the Holy Eucharist. Uh, the first part of the service is called the Liturgy of the Word, um, and we, we hear God's Word. We meditate on God's Word. We, we, we enter into conversation with God's Word. And then we turn our attention to, to the altar, to the table, and we experience, uh, indeed, uh, through receiving communion and sharing communion, uh, what we've just experienced through Word um, as we've studied the text. So even our services... Um, are, are bracketed uh, with, with word and deed. It was not surprising at all that when we come to chapter 8, which follows the Sermon on the Mount, what, what we discover here is, is Jesus beginning to act out His earthly ministry in, 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 in tangible, visible um, ways within the community. So we, we, we spent three chapters, chapters 5, 6, and 7, listening to, to Jesus offer God's Word. And, and here in chapter 8, we're picking up uh, God's deed. So if, if we look at uh, chapter 8, what we discover first uh, is Jesus comes down from the mountain and, and the first thing that He does is cleanse a leper. Um, I think perhaps um, those of us who are, who are even um, a little familiar with, uh, with the Gospel know that the lepers within that Hebrew community would have been the outcasts. They would have been the untouchables. Um, they, they would have been ritually unclean and, and so banned from public worship. Um, and, and because they're banned from public worship, in a sense, they're really cut off from their relationship with God. Um, it's significant that Jesus' first act of public ministry is uh, to cleanse a leper. So, so right away we see that... Uh, Jesus' ministry includes the outcast. Um, the second thing that we see in chapter 8 is um, 
Jesus healing the servant of the centurion. Uh, the centurion would have been really the incarnation of, of all that the Hebrew, Hebrew people considered um, evil. Uh, the, the Romans were the oppressors. They, they were Gentiles. They were, they, were, they were people who bowed down to the emperor and worshipped uh, a god other than the god of the Hebrew people. So uh, we see in these two instances, first Jesus reaches out to, to the unclean, the outcast, and, and then he reaches out to those who would have been just um, the, the antithesis of everything that the Hebrew people would have considered holy. Um, so we understand that Jesus' ministry is extended to the outcast and even to those who we would, um, who, who we, we would refuse to have any sort of uh, conversation or, or any interaction with. Uh, so, so hugely important. And then um, his, first, his third act is to, um, to go to Peter's house where he discovers Peter's mother-in-law who is ill and he heals her and as a result... Um, all the people from the surrounding community come to him and he casts out demons and heals the sick. So, so we learn several very important um, um, aspects of Jesus' ministry uh, within those first uh, three um, um, interactions with people. His ministry is to the outcast, um, either the centurion or the lepers, and, and, it's, and it's available to everybody. Um, by healing all those in the, in the town or the surrounding villages. So once those, that, that series of healing is accomplished, um, Jesus uh, gets into the boat and, and we have uh, this episode where he and the disciples are, are uh, on the water in the evening. It says um, uh, in 8.23, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O men of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? It's really a marvelous story. It's really one of my favorite stories out of, uh, out of all of uh, Jesus' life. Uh, here the, the disciples are uh, in fear for their lives. They're, they're being cast about on this little fishing boat. Uh, and, and Jesus is just um, completely at ease, asleep in the back of the boat. Um, and as they fear they're about to be swamped, they wake him. And it's interesting that, that, that what they say to him is, Lord, save us. Um, and if we think about Jesus' name in Hebrew is Joshua, which really uh, comes from the Hebrew or the Aramaic that means God saves. So they, they call out to the person named God saves to save us, God. Um, it's, it's a wonderful um, sort of instance um, in the life of the disciples where uh, the very name that they invoke is the very thing that they want. Uh, and Jesus uh, certainly uh, rises up uh, um, from his sleep and he calms the wind and the waves uh, just by the power of his word. Uh, in, in Luke's gospel, I believe, he says, peace be still. Uh, it's, it's the power of God's word Jesus' word that calms the wave and the waters. And when we think about Jesus' identity as God incarnate, uh, that, that voice that he uses to speak with, peace be still, um, is the same voice that would have said, let there be light. Um, so, so it's unmistakable that if, if God can create um, out of the chaos at the very beginning, this, this beautiful creation then certainly it's not too much to imagine that God's voice and, and, and the power of His presence would be able to calm the wind and the water, uh, just as it did in the very beginning. It's a beautiful and powerful sort of image. Um, I think this is a particularly important story for us because when Jesus rebukes the disciples, He says, um, O you of little faith. He, he doesn't say, O you of no faith. 
the, the disciples have enough faith to turn to him uh, seeking refuge, seeking safety. Um, and, and he recognizes that. And I think that's important for us because um, how often are we being tossed about um, on the waves or the water of life? How often do we find ourselves in a time of conflict or stress or anxiety, perhaps in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and, and we wonder, how are we going to navigate our way to shore? Uh, how, how do we get out of this? And, 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 and perhaps uh, it's in those moments of, of great conflict or great stress um, that our faith is challenged and we may discover that we don't have quite as much faith as we thought we had. And, and so I can hear Jesus' voice coming to, to us, oh, you of little faith. And, and what's so beautiful about that is, is our lack of faith is made up by Jesus' abundance of faith um, and, 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 and God prevails and, and gets us through that conflict safely to shore. I think the challenge in a situation like that is that, is that we tend to, uh, just as the, as the disciples did, um, they, are, they are looking out the front of the boat or the sides of the boat and they, and they see the, the, the wind and, and the waves and, 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 the, and they're, they're terrified. And, and they turn to Jesus and, and ask him for something. Um, that, that is a beautiful metaphor in, in my thinking because uh, when they turn to Jesus, um, the, the Greek word for that would be metanoia, which means repent, which really just means turn around. Um, the, the disciples are looking out at the turbulence of the world, at the chaos, um, when they've got God incarnate in the boat with them. So, so they're really focused on the wrong thing uh, rather than being consumed by the anxiety uh, or, or uh, the turbulence of the, of the wind and the waves, the water all around them. Uh, what they should be focused on is the fact that they've got God incarnate in the boat with them. And, and if God is with us, then, then who's against us? Um, so it's, it's a beautiful sort of image of, uh, of, of Jesus' faith and our faith coming together uh, to, to create a new and, and redeemed situation. Um, it's an invitation, a gentle invitation to repentance, to turn around and face, uh, face God, face Christ and enter more fully into relationship with Him. So uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful sort of episode out of Jesus' life and I think provides us with a kind of strength and, and, um, and confidence that, that no matter what we face, uh, we face it with the risen Christ and with the risen Christ with the power uh, of the resurrection. So I think we can see in this little episode um, word and deed coming together in a way that is really uh, beautiful and profound, um, I think it, it, um, it really harkens back to where we were at the beginning of this particular um, episode of the Rector's Forum where I talked about word and, and, and deed and that, and that Jesus begins with the word but, but then acts that out through deed. And so we as a worshiping community, as Christ Church, uh, we, we hear God's word and, and that calls us to respond through deed, uh, which again is a, is a wonderful sort of um, invitation to us to, to hear God's word and, and then not just uh, let it rest there, but then to take that word and, and act it out in deed. Um, I certainly believe that's, that's how we're called to respond as Christians, to uh, enter into that relationship, to experience the joy uh, of God's presence with us. Uh, speak of that um, in word and then enact that in deed. So uh, we'll, we'll continue and we'll see more of, uh, of Jesus um, acting out that ministry, acting out that word in the successive chapters of, of Matthew's gospel. Uh, but, but we will probably continue to hearken back to uh, the message that he offers us in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, those, those critically important chapters of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So, so with that, we'll, we'll bring today's uh, little conversation to a close. And as we do, um, I mentioned the pandemic, and, and um, it, it certainly is um, a hopeful time uh, to imagine that, that uh, perhaps we are emerging from a pandemic. And, and so uh, with that as the, the context, uh, let me offer 
let me offer this prayer, which is one of my favorites, um, out of our prayer book. So let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.